Hey, how you doing, econ students? This is Mr. Clifford. It's time for a super quick review of all of macroeconomics. I have this big poster. All the concepts are all here somewhere. So let's jump into it. We're looking at scarcity. Scarcity is the first question in the test. It's usually talking about unlimited wants and limited resources. The test also might talk about trade-offs or opportunity costs. The big trick in unit one, though, is the idea of the production possibilities curve. I want you to remember, a bowed out curve shows increasing opportunity cost and the law of increasing opportunity cost. And a constant or straight line production possibilities curve shows constant opportunity cost. This one, the resources produced the two products are completely different. And this one, the resources are very similar. Now we're going to talk about economic systems. There's three different types, command economies, free market, and mixed economies. Right? In the free market, individuals own the resources, and there is private property. In the command economy, the government owns the resources, and there's no private property. Right? The production possibilities curve also shifts. There's three things that shift the curve, quantity of resources, technology, and trade. Talking about trade, a key concept you're going to see on the macro exam is comparative advantage. Right? You set up the country on the left and the products in the very top, and you calculate how much is the per unit opportunity cost for one country in terms of the product they could have produced. So down here, if China can produce five cars or 15 food, each one car costs them three food, and each one food costs them one third of a car. Remember, the country that has the lower opportunity cost has therefore a comparative advantage. So in this situation, the United States should produce cars because they only give up one food for each car they produce, and China gives up three food for each car they produce. Down here is the circular flow. This is the big picture of the entire economy. It has the product market and the resource market. We have firms and individuals. Individuals buy goods and services from businesses in the product market. So the individuals demand and businesses supply. But in the resource market, the individuals supply their land, labor, and capital, and the businesses demand that land, labor, and capital. Also remember the government is involved, and one of the things they do is called transfer payments, which is direct payments to individuals. This is a form of welfare, and when the government gives money straight to people, again, this is called transfer payments. Now let's look over here, and we'll jump into macroeconomics. The most important concept is GDP. If you remember, the whole course is separated between two things. Measuring the economy and fixing it. In this unit, you'll measure it, and the other units will talk about fixing the problem. GDP is the dollar value of the final goods and services produced. It's made up of CIGXN. Remember, I is business spending, which is investment. It's never personal investments like stocks and bonds. Unemployment, there's three types, frictional, structural, and cyclical. And if you add up all the frictional and structural, you come up with the natural rate of unemployment. Also remember, the labor force participation rate is the percent of people in the labor force uh, who are eligible to actually work, who are actually working. The big problems of unemployment rate are discouraged workers and part-time workers. Remember, discouraged workers are people who should be considered unemployed, but they're not looking for work. And part-time workers are counted as fully employed, even though they want more hours. There's also the idea of inflation. Inflation was a CPI, Consumer Price Index, price of the market basket divided by the price of the market basket in the base year times 100. It's an index number. It tells you how prices changed since the base year. Similar to that was the GDP deflator, which was the nominal GDP of a given year divided by the real GDP of that same year times 100. Again, this adjusts for inflation. It shows you uh, an index number. So 120 shows you that inflation or the prices have gone up 20% since the base year. Also remember the business cycle. We've got four different phases. We've got a peak. We've got a contraction or a recession. Then we've got a trough and then we have an expansion. The economy can only be in one of three places at any given period of time, inflation, right, recession, or at full employment. And you'll show these graphs in the next unit. Macro unit three is the most important unit because we're introducing the idea of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We've got three different lines, AD, AS, and the LRAS. Down the middle is the idea of full employment. If aggregate demand is to the right and we're here, this is the recessionary gap, and over here is an inflationary gap. Remember, the economy can only be in one of three places. Along the same lines, we learned the Phillips curve, which has inflation and unemployment, the vertical long-run Phillips curve with three spots, full employment, recessionary gap, and inflationary gap. If the aggregate demand shifts, that's movement along the Phillips curve. If the aggregate supply shifts, that means the entire short-run Phillips curve will either increase or decrease. The shifters of aggregate demand are CIGX, and any of these things will increase or decrease the aggregate demand. And aggregate supply shifters are things that affect producers, like the price of resources, taxes and subsidies on producers, or some sort of change in productivity. One of the key vocab terms to watch out for is the idea of stagflation. Remember, that's when aggregate supply shifts to the left, sometimes called a negative supply shock. Price level goes up, output goes down, and the economy is in the worst case situation. 
Now, when we're in these situations, we can solve them by doing fiscal policy. There's two different types of policies you have to learn. Fiscal policy in this unit and monetary policy you learn in unit four. Fiscal policy, there's two different types, expansionary and contractionary. Expansionary is either increased government spending or cutting taxes. This would increase aggregate demand. Or contractionary fiscal policy is cutting government spending or increasing taxes. This is called discretionary fiscal policy when the government is making new laws. Non-discretionary fiscal policy is called the automatic stabilizers when there's already laws in place that slow down or speed up the economy. Now remember, when the government increases government spending, that has a multiplier effect, which is one over the marginal propensity to save. So if people save just a little bit, the multiplier is bigger, and you have to be able to calculate, for example, if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.9, that means the marginal propensity to save is 0.1, so the multiplier is 10. So if the government increases government spending, it'll get multiplied times 10. Also remember that taxes have less of an effect because the tax multiplier is one less than the spending multiplier. Another key concept is to know how the economy adjusts to a new long run. For example, when aggregate demand shifts to the right, in the long run, eventually wages will go up and aggregate supply will shift to the left, putting us back in long run. If aggregate demand shifted down and we have a lower price level and we have high unemployment, eventually in the long run, wages will fall, aggregate supply will go back to full employment. So remember, aggregate supply will always adjust back to full employment in the long run. In the short run, we have an inflationary gap or a recessionary gap. Now, another possibility is when there's an increase in the entire economy of economic growth. So when there's a decrease in interest rates and there's an increase in investment, we have more machinery, more capital, more capital stock. Aggregate demand goes up because there's an increased investment. Aggregate supply goes up, but so does the long run aggregate supply. This is the idea of economic growth, and it's shown here with a production possibilities curve shifting outward. Now, sometimes when the government uses fiscal policy, they spend, and when they spend, they have to borrow the money, and this leads to the idea of crowding out. Crowding out is when the government increases government spending and has unintended consequences on the economy. So they increase government spending and therefore increase interest rates. That decreases investment, and it doesn't fully close a recessionary gap. Again, that's called crowding out. Now, the aggregate supply curve has three different shapes, the Keynesian, intermediate, and classical range. The Keynesian range is the idea that wages are sticky, so price level doesn't really go down as we're in really bad unemployment. But as we get closer to full employment, that means wages start going up. It doesn't matter. We can't produce any more. And so the quantity at some point is completely set because we can't produce more beyond some point. Again, that's classical and Keynesian range. Now, now really quickly, let's talk about inflation. There's three reasons why there's inflation. It's because the government prints out too much money, which we talked about right here, called the quantity theory of money. Anytime you increase the money supply and the velocity of money stays the same, then the price of goods is going to go up, right? So what you need to know is the idea that anytime we increase the amount of money, eventually prices will go up by the same exact amount. There's another two types of inflation called demand pull and cost push. Demand pull inflation is when there's an increase in aggregate demand. Cost push is when there's a decrease in aggregate supply leading to stagflation. And that's unit three. All right, in unit four, we're going to talk about money and banking. The first concept is the idea of the different types of money. There's fiat money that has no other purpose. It has no intrinsic value. And there's commodity money like gold or silver or something like that where we can do something else with it. All right, the functions of money are three things. It's a medium of exchange. It's a unit of account. It's a store of value. And then, of course, the concept of the money supply and demand. This is called the money market graph. The demand for money happens for two reasons, asset demand and transaction demand. And the supply of money is set by the central bank of a country, in this case, the Fed in the United States. So we have interest rate and quantity of money, and there's the graph. Expansionary monetary policy is when the Fed increases the money supply. This will decrease interest rates, increase investment, increase aggregate demand, speeding up the economy. Decrease in money supply is called contractionary monetary policy. This would decrease money supply, increase interest rates, decrease investment, and therefore slow down the economy, decrease aggregate demand. There's three shifters that you absolutely need to know. They are the reserve requirement, discount rate, and open market operations. Open market operations is the most important one. It's the buying and selling of bonds, also called securities, or sometimes called T-bills or treasury bills. All right, so a reserve requirement, now how much banks have to hold by law. If they decrease, if the Fed decreases reserve requirement, that will increase my supply. If they increase the reserve requirement, Banks have to hold more money in reserves, and they can't loan it out, and so supply of money would decrease. The discount rate is how much the Fed charges banks to borrow money. They can lower it and increase the money supply, or they can raise it and make it harder for banks to borrow and decrease the money supply. And again, buy big, sell small. If the Fed buys bonds, it makes the money supply bigger. 
if the Fed sells bonds, it makes my supply smaller. Now let's go talk about interest rates. There's a difference between nominal and real interest rates. Let's say that there's 5% inflation and you charge someone a 5% nominal interest rate. When you get paid back, do you actually get 5%? No, because the real interest rate is actually only zero because the inflation has eroded that interest rate. So the real interest rate is your nominal minus that inflation. Now, as you know, banks create money and that's called fractional reserve banking. When a money goes into a bank, people put it in deposits, the bank holds a portion by law and loans the rest out. When they loan it out, they're actually creating money. Now there's a concept called bank balance sheet showing you liabilities and assets. Liabilities like demand deposits, the money that money is deposited into banks is a liability to a bank. The assets is what they do with the money. So the required reserves, what they hold in reserves, then they can loan the money out or they can have excess reserves that they haven't loaned out yet. To figure out how much money is actually created by banks, you have to figure out the money multiplier. It's just like the spending multiplier, except it's different because it's one over the reserve requirement. So if money comes into a bank, they're going to hold a portion and then the rest is going to get multiplied times the money multiplier. Now remember, money that comes in from someone's pocket, if I take money out of my pocket, put it in my bank, that's already part of the money supply. So the only money that's created is the money that's newly loaned out. However, when the Fed buys bonds, that is all brand new money, so the entire amount gets multiplied. But there's another term you need to know, it's called the federal funds rate. This is the rate that banks charge each other to borrow money. So the Fed uses this as a target rate. They buy bonds in the open market operations to try to get the banks to loan each other at loan to each other at that federal funds rate. So it's not a rate the Fed controls, or they control the discount rate, but they usually try to target the federal funds rate. There's another key graph that I'm gonna introduce. It's called the loanable funds graph. It's the demand and supply for loans, and it sets the real interest rate. 99% of the time on the AP test, they talk to you about where the government borrows. So if the government does deficit spending and borrows money, that increases the demand for loanable funds leads to higher interest rates, and the idea of crowding out, which you learned earlier, right? Remember, crowding out when the government borrows leads to higher interest rates and actually slows down the economy as opposed to actually expanding the economy. Okay, the last unit in macroeconomics was Unit 5, Trade and Foreign Exchange. The first concept we learned was the idea of the balance of payments. This measures all the transactions between different countries, not just goods and services, but the sale and purchase of assets. And that's the two subaccounts. So the balance of payments has the current account, which shows you goods and services, and the capital account that focuses on assets. So if a country sells something to another country, like a, a service or a good, like planes in another country, that would be part of the current account. Now, if the other country takes that money and goes buys bonds from the other country, that's not a good service, that's part of the financial account. So if you remember, this is the idea of net exports. Exports minus imports. In the United States, this is negative because we have a trade deficit with other countries. We also have a financial account surplus with other countries because Anytime you have a current account deficit, you have to have a surplus in the financial account. So we buy other countries' stuff and they buy our financial assets. So remember, net exports is exports minus imports, right? But over here, the financial account has inflow versus outflow, right? This is the idea of inflow of financial assets or is there outflow of money going out to buy financial assets. Now let's talk about foreign exchange and the idea of appreciation and depreciation of currencies. If a currency's dollar or its currency appreciates, that means there's gonna be a decrease in net exports. It seems like appreciation's a good thing, but it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. If the dollar appreciates, our exports would fall. People are gonna buy less of our stuff and we'll buy more of their stuff, and so our net exports, our net exports will fall. If our currency depreciates, people are gonna buy more of our stuff and we'll buy less of their stuff, and so our net exports would actually go up. To figure these concepts out, you have to draw the graph for foreign exchange. This shows you the dollar compared to the yen. That's why it says yen over dollar, quantity of dollars. Here's demand and supply setting the exchange rate. There are four different shifters. They are change in taste, income, price level, and interest rates. The only one that's hard is the idea of interest rates. Remember, higher interest rates will attract in foreign investment from other countries in the financial account, right? If there's higher interest rates, then other countries go, oh, I wanna buy bonds in another country, get that higher interest rate. That would increase the demand for the currency which will lead to appreciation of that currency. So a quick rule, interest rates are only good in foreign exchange. That's when people want higher interest rates. Back when we talked about monetary policy and we talked about aggregate demand and supply, higher interest rates are a bad thing because they decrease investment inside that country. That is the speed review of all five units of macroeconomics. Don't forget there's five key graphs that you absolutely need to know. Aggregate demand and supply, the Phillips curve, money market supply and demand, 
loanable funds, and the foreign exchange graph. If you know those five graphs, you pretty much have every pay response covered. Until next time.